masterpiece of Shakespeare. And I had a lot of trouble getting the, the thing off the ground because people sort of said, well, he wasn't a poet. The point being that I didn't consider any um, attitude or any description of what he was doing final. I just think you can keep digging into this mine of a, of a, of a, of a character endlessly. Largely because I, I, I feel quite deeply that his intellect is certainly bigger than mine. So I'm going to keep finding things in his stuff over and over again. So please don't think I've got the final answer. And I'm going to give you the definitive thing of what Shakespeare is about. We will have fun going through it together, I hope. Um, and bits will come up which we can discuss and wrangle about. But I don't feel I have the final answer at all. I don't think David felt he had the final answer. I think he, he has a very um, deep interpretation of Shakespeare and that we can participate in that and go along with him and then see what, illumin what is illuminated for us. And bearing in mind with that, there is, there is a, there's quite a bit of scholarship which would suggest Shakespeare didn't just write the plays as plays. He was party to them being printed. He didn't seem to be a big mover about them being printed, but he did actually have several of them printed, which could have been just purely so that he had his uh, copyright established, um, because there were a lot of the writers at that time, and there were many very good writers at that time, were pinching ideas off each other left, right, and centre. And several of Shakespeare's plays have been cobbled from, certainly the ideas for them have been coupled from other playwrights who produced plays four or five years earlier with the same title. So we know that this was going on backwards and forwards. But what that would mean is that he was also writing for an educated class that were just going to read his stuff. That there's more in them than you can catch in one performance, there's more, more in them than you can catch in I would say seven or eight performances, you really do need to have to pick over things. And what we're going to be doing is picking over them. We won't be taking a play and running through it, unfortunately, because that's maybe for another time. But what David has done for us here is he's taken themes out of Shakespeare. And the first theme we're going to be taking, we started with it, uh, I think it's about eight weeks ago now, I'm not sure, with the realm. And the, the whole process. Now, what I'm of literally what it is to be substantially committed to a world, um, and hopefully more of that will unfold as we go on. Unfortunately, we got about five pages into it last time, and they're the important five pages. Are the people here, there must be people here who weren't here last time. Did you put a hoof in the air? Fine. Thank you. Okay. Well, for the benefit of them, and for anybody who may have forgotten what we said, like me, <laughs> we, will, we will just rapidly fly through the first five pages so quickly you won't even notice. But, but before we do, I thought I'd give you a little reading from a very ancient guru who um, you may have come across. But, Perhaps you and I were talking about the fact that we should go to contemporary great philosophers. <laughs> so, we, you know, we constantly too far, pushing both forward. Indeed, indeed. Okay. Right. Just a simple quote. From Alan to March. What is gardening? Okay. If you ask a gardener why or he or she gardens, you might just as well ask why they breathe. It's because they can't imagine life without it. Gardening is part art and part science, but more than anything else, it's a craft that is fueled by a subterranean passion. It's all about nurturing and achieving, triumphing over nature and harmonizing with it. It panders to one of our primitive hunter-gathering instincts. It can be incredibly satisfying and also very humbling. It can also be frustrating, annoying, and let's be honest, disappointing. Okay. 
Why am I quoting from Garvin? Well, because the realm is a garden. We're going to say, come across many metaphors in Shakespeare which refer to the garden of this world, the garden England, mm -hmm. the garden lands, mm -hmm. and the whole reference to what is going on in terms of that nurturing, the humbling, the elevating, the subterranean passions, the movement of having a plot of something to work on. And the metaphors will be of the body, of a piece of land, of a kingdom, of an earth, of a world, of a nutshell. All these things are relevant to what Shakespeare is talking about when he talks about the realm. And if you think in terms of historically what human beings have come through, the garden is a terribly important concept. It's something to work on. It's something you can call yours. It is a guarded place. You guard it. That's where the word garden comes from. And the Garden of Eden is the origins of what I would say is the most civilizing part of us. We are hierarchically structured. We are zoned. We are placed in our context in terms of our work in the world. And the place that we work, whether it's an office, a studio, a classroom, wherever it is, it's a place, it's a field of operation, and that's what the realm is. Your realm is your field of operation. At the ultimate, it is your body. You know, this little earth, and Shakespeare will refer to that. It's this thing that you're responsible for, that you're putting your time into and developing in whatever way you do. Somebody met me about two months ago and said to me, I want you to know what you don't with yourself. Just heard my voice. I want you to know what you've done with yourself, to see what sort of a man you were. I wish I'd had a shower. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. When you meet somebody in the flesh, you get a completely different feel from who they are and what they are. On the telephone, you can pull the wool over people's eyes, like, I've done it. You know, I, I'm a lot taller and more handsome on the time. Um, but when you meet somebody in the flesh, you actually come across them and you see them, how they're working with this thing that they have been given. And it's got foibles and knots and processes inside it, and none of us are perfect. Eugene used to say, we're all damaged goods. I certainly am, and he considered himself to be damaged goods. So we're all working with a field of operation. Okay? And it's interesting when you meet somebody to see that, and this ultimately is the one, probably the first one you started with, and probably the last one you'll still be working on. Okay? So I'm going to start the text. I'm going to fly through it, but I'll still ask for people to do the odd quote, if you're feeling up to it. Don't feel you must, but you will get more from it if you have a go. One might have supposed that in writing about kings it would be better first to define their function, but in addressing our attention to the substance, body or estate, over which a monarch holds sway, we shall in real terms define his function. Indeed the ruler and the ruled define each other so closely that they are linked. The one is never an arbitrary imposition on the other. The realm gets the king and the king gets the realm that each deserves. With only slight amendment of the maxim, vox populi, vox dei, that means the voice of the people is the voice of God. One may say that a subject, unable to govern himself, cries out for the kind of king he needs. And if we consider that a divine providence overlooks all and directs all, then every king or would-be king is presented with the realm which best will assay his mettle and provide the kinds of tests he needs. As we shall discover in treating of man as his own self-king, the king and his realm are aspects of one being, indissolubly bound together and acting reciprocally upon each other. The governor knows full well that service is at the heart of his function. He is ruled by the needs of those he governs. Unless he understands and honours the dialectic of his tacit contract, he will be rejected by the realm which will manifest in its body politic the disorders of its titular head. Okay? Now that very word <coughs> politic